is that your employer, Audubon, was engaged to perform vapor dispersion modeling and analysis for use in developing high consequence areas, also known as HCAs, and that's part of the work you did, correct? Correct. And when was Audubon first hired by Summit uh, relative to any CO2 pipeline work? The best guess on my part it was around the beginning of this year. So beginning of this year, so early 2023. Correct. And prior to that time, you're not aware of Audubon um, being contracted or being asked to do any work or analysis for Summit. We were working on other um parts of the project with Summit that were that are well that didn't involve vapor dispersion. Okay. And just briefly, what were the those other parts of the project that you were working on prior to the beginning of twenty twenty three? So for example, we started on the risk analysis with Summit initially is how we got involved. And for risk analysis, well, okay, let's back up. When was Audubon first hired to do risk analysis? Yeah, it's uh, it was probably mid last year. Okay, the middle of 2022. And when you say risk analysis, that work you differentiate as being separate from vapor dispersion uh, modeling and analysis. It's a separate scope of work, yes. And in terms of HCAs, we've talked a bit about those, but HCAs, high consequence areas, those are federally defined terms of art. Would you agree? Agree. And there are four main categories of HCAs under federal uh, regulation. Is that fair? Yes. And one of the one of the HCAs uh, includes population areas of greater than fifty thousand um, persons. Correct. Uh, the two that uh, involve population are HPAs and OPAs, so highly populated areas and other populated areas. Okay, and uh, and highly popul populated areas are considered uh, by f at least federal um, regulators as containing 50,000 or more persons. I think that's correct. In my mind, the... Uh, the big differentiator around HCA is it exists in a, I'm sorry, HPA, is it exists in an incorporated boundary. Correct. And that's a good qualifier. So it's, it's a set number of persons within an incorporated or defined boundary, correct? Yes. And you would agree that um, certainly uh, throughout Iowa where this proposed pipeline could be located, there are lots of areas where there are are people and define boundaries, but that they don't necessarily reach that 50,000 or more threshold. There are many more OPAs within Iowa than HCAs. That is a true statement. And for OPAs, what, well, what's your understanding of the technical definition of an OPA? An OPA is an area that has some population density as defined by the U.S. Census. And the U.S. Census is, as we know, updated every 10 years. That's correct. So OPAs and analyzing them, um, the data is pretty much stale after each census and then isn't updated or, or, or modified until the next census. As far as the federal government goes, that's true. Operators have the option and ability to curate their own HCA data at any time. And so is it your understanding that HCA, is that like kind of the umbrella or an overarching factor of which the, the OPAs or the HPAs, did those fall under HCA analysis or are those kind of separate things you look at? So each one of the four that you referred to are potential HCAs. So uh, if I've got any of these four um, entities, then it's a high, con it's that area is defined as a high consequence area by PHMSA. And PHMSA requires a, a potential pipeline operator to identify all HCAs as defined by PHMSA. It requires 
the operator to define all HCAs, including those that are defined or identified by the operator. All right. And so regardless of if someone's living in a, a populated area, 50,000 persons or more, or 500 persons, you understand that um, the persons in smaller populated areas likely care just as much about their family and their health and well-being as those in larger communities, right? I understand. And you discuss uh, the vapor dispersion modeling and what information it, it provides. Is it your testimony that PHMSA requires a, a potential pipeline operator to actually perform vapor dispersion modeling? So, so the short answer is yes. That's part of the integrity management rule, which is triggered by the existence of an HCA. And you're aware that federal law or FEMSA is not in charge of siting or locating hazardous pipelines, correct? Correct. And, and so we can agree that dispersion analysis may be a tool or data required by FEMSA regulations, uh, but would you agree that that type of data is also um, important data to know when considering potential routing of a hazardous pipeline? Uh, if you're asking my, for my experience, my experience is that um, vapor dispersion studies or any other thing under the integrity management rule are typically not considered um, for routing pipelines. And your answer there is based on, on the premise that I was asking from the op operator or pipeline company owner's standpoint, correct? That's correct. And so as we sit here today, you understand that we're not necessarily looking at what any particular party wants, but the lens through which the board may be making decisions as to routing and siting. I understand. And, and you would agree it would be reasonable um, when you're thinking about um, a, a greenfield project such as this, one that doesn't exist in a state and it, it would be the first ever in the state of Iowa, that it would be reasonable to consider the vapor modeling and analysis in making routing decisions in Iowa, right? I think what, what is much more important to consider uh, from an engineering standpoint are uh, the preventive and mitigative measures that would go along with design and operation of the pipeline and its uh, potential impact on the community that surrounds it. So from an engineering perspective, you're focused more on what can we do to prevent uh, a worst case scenario or prevent an unintended release as opposed to maybe we shouldn't even locate near that particular community, right? Yes. But, but again, and I appreciate from your engineering perspective, but from a regulatory body looking at an intelligent location or perhaps no location, you would agree that it would be reasonable to analyze the risk to persons and, and livestock before making siting decisions. I'm not going to speculate on reasonable. You... Um, Okay, so you, you prepared some uh, documents um, related to your vapor dispersion analysis. When do you first recollect being asked to uh, prepare or perform that type of work? I think, did I state mid-2023 or was it early 2023? We've been working on this project for about six months now, to my recollection. And, and, and again, this project, meaning the vapor dispersion specifically. Okay. Yes. Um, and have you or your firm prepared draft reports that you provided to your client summit at any time? Yes. How many drafts have you gone through? In the state of Iowa, um, two drafts for... What you will see in the testimony as referred to as a conservative approach, and one draft of what you will see referred to as a uh, punk, uh, mechanical puncture approach. 
And are those, are those approaches, in fact, combined into one document, or are you saying the way you your deliverable to your client was actually two separate drafts analyzing each of those approaches? It would be the latter, two separate drafts. Two separate drafts. Okay, and I'm sorry, one, one was a puncture approach, and that would uh, essentially be known as the third-party damage approach, correct? That's what we attempted to simulate. Correct. Understood. And and the other approach would be kind of the the guillotine or the that unintended release, other than a third caused by a third party. It would be intended to be a guillotine release. That's true. All right. Regardless of cause. Regardless of cause. Correct. All right. Um. And is that work that you continue to do based on Iowa specific factors or was the work that you did on those two approaches um, a project wide look that didn't take into account any Iowa specific inputs? So the vapor dispersion analysis considers um, the right of way which includes things like what's on the right of way, what the terrain looks like. So based on uh, that assertion, um, we looked at this, these routes specifically in the state of Iowa and analyzed the routes specifically in the state of Iowa as we did in the other states. And so when was, were you tax, tasked with the directive to determine worst case scenarios based on actual route specific factors on the proposed Iowa route. So the answer, I'm going to, I'm going to say the answer is yes. Okay. But what we did was, is once you see the, the route in Iowa, whether it's in Cornfield or Hayfield or what have you, one of those right-of-way conditions out of the number that exists in the state would produce a worst-case uh, CO2 concentration after a guillotine leak on the ground. And that worst case, or the most conservative case, was applied to the entire pipeline right away in Iowa. Does that make sense? Uh, let, let me paraphrase and correct me if I'm wrong. So in order to choose what you believe the worst case scenario was for Iowa, you analyzed the entire proposed route and then all things considered picked a location that based on the various factors uh, when combined together would produce what you believe to be the worst possible um, case of an unintended release in terms of co2 concentration on the ground and distance from the pipeline center line yes and, and is that necessarily the same location in terms of the the amount of concentrated co2 on the ground and the distance of travel or couldn't those be found at different geographic points so uh, the answer is no. We were we're only concerned with CO distance of travel of CO two concentration on the ground, on the ground. Okay. Oh, All right, and and we'll get into the the modeling um, in in a little bit. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about your testimony where you reference Satarsha, Mississippi and the uh, failure there of a CO2 pipeline. Do you recollect, was that Denbury pipeline in Satarsha, Mississippi, was that a 24-inch pipeline? I don't recollect, but it was a 20-inch range. Okay. I, I think it was 24 inches, but um, we, we can take a look at that to confirm. Uh, your, your understanding is within the state of Iowa, Summit is proposing up to 24-inch diameter pipeline. That's correct. Now, you would agree, and, and based on your analysis, that CO2 can be toxic by um, inhalation in humans? 
I'm not a uh, expert on toxicology, and I don't know if toxic is the right word, but yes, it poses a hazard for humans okay. in certain concentrations. Correct, and that includes um, the fact that CO2 is an asphyxiant and it can displace oxygen because it's heavier than oxygen, correct? Correct. Uh, and are you aware that um, individuals that could come in contact, contact with CO2 may experience rapid breathing, confusion, increased cardiac output, um, elevated blood pressure, and arrhythmias? Yes. And then in... in um, Extreme concentrations, potentially death, death by asphyxiation. Yes. Relative to the Satarsha incident, um, you're aware that FEMSA put out an, um, an incident report or what they call a failure investigation report? Yes. And did you review that um, prior to or after designing or preparing the vapor dispersion analysis? Those reports informed our process. Um, so we were aware of the, the results of FEMS's investigation prior to producing material work for this project. And you discuss a little bit about um, Aloha, which is a, a software, a publicly available uh, tool uh, for getting at least a rough estimate of potential distance and, and width of CO2 dispersion. Is that right? I am aware of Aloha, yes. All right. And you're aware also that it is a, a tool that's publicly available and um, allows for certain inputs that then produces outputs that mo may model a CO2 dispersion event. I don't believe Aloha has any CO2 specific, um, what's the word I'm looking for, application. Uh, but uh, so I think I answered your question. And in your testimony, you were asked if you agree that Aloha is a useful tool. Um, you say yes, you do qualify that um, for quickly producing reasonable results in a real emergency. W would you agree, sir, that that's a qualifier for, I guess my words, kind of a, a down and dirty and quick analysis, but it isn't the type of software that you would want to use when providing opinions on worst case favor dispersion analysis, right? That's my position, yes. And, and in fact, for, for first responders that may be able to quickly utilize it, it would give them an idea, but it wouldn't be nearly as reliable as some of the other more robust software available, such as the, the Canary, or even FAST, or even computational fluid dynamics, correct? It would give a conservative estimate of the vapor dispersion for which first responders could use as a starting point. As a starting point. Yep. Would you agree with me that in order for to, to, to kind of arm our first responders with the best available data that studies such that you did informed by Canary and Flow 2D modeling would give them a better idea of the potential disbursement range of a CO2 plume? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the intent of the of Summit's vapor dispersion really is to understand the impact of a release on receptors along the pipeline. Uh, that's first and foremost. Whether or not that um, that information uh, would be useful to first responders, you know, I'm, I'm, I won't speculate on that. I, I've I've never been in that first responder position um, in terms of preference of understanding the potential consequences or the potential um, you know, areas of a release. So w would you concede that in life or death situations and emergency response that more likely than not it would be appropriate to have the most specific and best information uh, available for those first responders? Yeah, again, a very good question. Um, within, <clears throat> within, a, within the model that we produce for Summit, there are uh, 
inputs uh, about um, of the weather, right? And if I'm a first responder, um, you know, and the weather on a particular day is X and Y, I might want to be able to see how that would affect the vapor plume on that day instead of looking at uh, a worst-case scenario that Audubon produced. So, uh, you know, generally more information is better, but uh, more information uh, could could mislead, I guess, in some cases, if that makes any sense. Well, but if the more information, and I think how you were parsing that, would be providing a worst-case scenario, um, uh, you know, you use the word mislead, but wouldn't you agree if I'm armed with it, on the front end, what a worst case scenario is, I can back into and prepare better and kind of understand the geographic distance of my emergency response as opposed to getting, for instance, a 911 call and trying to locate Aloha and quickly yeah. type in things, right? Yeah, I don't know, uh, again, from the first responder process how that happens, but, uh, you know, I, I guess I'll just leave it at, you know, more information is better in terms of responding to an emergency. Whether or not um, uh, first responders' preference would be to look at information that was produced by the pipeline operator or not, I, I can't speak to their, their processes. Would you agree along those lines that more information is also better in preparation for a potential emergency, not just an instantaneous response? Yes, so there, there are a number of things that the vapor dispersion will, will inform in terms of some of its operating procedures. One of them is a risk model. The other one is their, their public awareness plan. The other one is their emergency response plan. So yes, the results of the vapor dispersion model will inform and provide guidance to uh, in other um, operating areas of the pipeline. Okay, and but also would be helpful for first responders or counties um, determining what resources they need on the front end to be prepared prior to an emergent event. Right? Yeah, I was, re I was agreeing with your statement. So, you know, part of Summit's responsibility here is to work with local first responders and make sure that they understand um, the potential exposure, make sure that they're equipped to deal with that exposure should worst case happen, right? So in terms of uh, people, training, and equipment, Yes. Now, related to the Satarsha incident, we, we've covered the 200 folks that were evacuated and the 45 that sought medical attention. Uh, w would you agree that um, part of the, let's say, intensity of that release had to deal with something called, or, or a fun phenomenon known as atmospheric inversion? I'm not aware of that. Um, the 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 full details of Satarsha uh, and what actually happened with Satarsha outside of what was reported by FEMSA. Uh, I'm not aware that that was one of the, uh, one of the things that actually FEMSA pointed to or anyone pointed to. So setting Satarsha aside, are you as an engineer familiar, familiar with the concept of atmospheric inversion? Uh, in detail? No. How about in general? In general? No. So, um, how do you go about then selecting inputs to inform what would be a worst case scenario, such as temperature? Um, I guess how do you how do you go about that, or did you accept that the inputs that Summit told you it wanted modeled? So, the inputs to the model, um, whatever model you're choosing whatever model you're working with are defined by the software manufacturer. You have those uh, listed in um, one of my exhibits that have been submitted. The answer to your question is, um, you know, some, some it didn't tell us uh, what the inputs were, uh, what inputs to use or what values to use. Basically, when you look at the inputs that are required for the paper dispersion analysis, Audubon ran a sensitivity analysis um, using uh, one very variation of one input at a time, right? So when you look at um, 
me see. When you look at uh, release angle, it would be an example, right? There's an optimum release angle that will produce a maximum concentration of CO2 some distance away from the pipeline at grade. And so that sensitivity analysis defined the worst case inputs, worst case parameters for the analysis, for the overall analysis. Well, wouldn't you agree that depending upon the inputs that you analyze, that can um, skew the ultimate outputs? Skew in a conservative direction, which is what we're after, yes. We well, okay, they, they could skew either way. I mean, I'm not saying you did this, but I could, if I wanted to get to an intended result theoretically, knowing that the information might be public available and I don't want it to be as dangerous, certainly a person could select inputs, essentially game the system to show um, less concerning outputs, right? An unethical uh, person could. Okay. And someone well-intended who didn't do a thorough job also could lead to the same result, correct? So when you look at atmospheric vapor dispersion models um, and you look at the suite of tools that is available, whether it's Canary, Fast, CFD, garbage in is garbage out, right? So the results depend on the ability and the experience of the modeler. In that regard, would you agree that cooler temperatures tend to produce a worse scenario in terms of an in unintended release, all of their factors being equal? Are you talking about atmospheric temperature? Atmospheric temperature. Yes, so the, the most conservative cases for um, that we identified were winter cases. And in your experience, is there, is the colder it is, the worse? So if we took it kind of to the ridiculous, we get way into the negative temperatures, does it get worse? Or is there kind of a range of um, more likely uh, cool temperatures that you model? It would be the latter. All right. And then would you also agree that the less wind actually creates the potential for the higher level of concentration and the more negative potential health effects. So wind was one of the sensitivity factors that we evaluated and there was an optimum wind speed at which the uh, concentrations at grade reached furthest from the pipeline center line. Okay, so and, and I appreciate that. There obviously wind clearly can move and um, is a big factor on which direction a plume would travel. It's it's generally goes with the prevailing wind. Is that fair? That's my understanding. And and if you were modeling to try to show how far a plume would go, you might pick a, a certain type of wind speed. But would you agree that no wind speed actually can produce at the site of the rupture the worst possible scenario because there's not a wind dispersing the CO2 molecules. So the site of the rupture is worst case irregardless of what the wind is doing, okay, because that's where you've got 98% CO2 escaping that pipeline. Okay. Um, and in terms of modeling wind, would you agree that modeling um, higher wind speeds, although maybe counterintuitive, actually more likely than not would produce um, not as bad scenarios because of the phenomenon of the wind dispersing the CO2 molecules? High wind speed leads to turbulence, turbulence leads to mixing, mixing leads to reduced CO2 concentrations at grade. You had talked a bit ago about public awareness and emergency response. In your work, are you familiar with um, 
considering buffers in terms of public awareness, emergency response, and initial routing? Is that a concept you're familiar with? No. When you were discussing public awareness, um, in your experience, is public awareness kind of a range, like for instance, within X number of feet from the center line of the pipeline, that's where we want the public to be aware that the pipeline even exists, or, or what's your understanding of public awareness concept and why it's important? So my understanding of public awareness is as it's written and defined in 195 in this case, and the requirements that are incumbent upon each operator uh, under the 195 pop pipeline code to create and execute a public awareness program. Okay, so basically compliance with the federal minimum standards relative to public awareness. Exactly. And you would agree that um, aside from just complying with what the federal regs are, if we're talking about real people in a, in a real state like Iowa, you would agree that it's prudent to go above and beyond the federal minimums in your outreach and education relative to the hazards uh, associated with the CO2 pipeline. I would agree that uh, whatever the, fe uh, the federal and state regulations and laws are that govern the siting, design, construction, operation of the pipeline should be followed. Okay, so I, I asked a little bit different question. Um, certainly you want to comply and check all the FEMSA boxes. I, I don't dispute that, but it FEMSA doesn't prevent a pipeline company such as Summit from sharing its analysis that it contracted you to do to best inform the public of this potential project and the potential risks, right? I'm not aware that they do. So, In regard, are you familiar with integrity management programs, IMPs? Yes, sir. And do you recollect that on the, in the Denbury, the Satarsha incident that FEMSA uh, found that Denbury, in fact, did identify geotechnical geotechn hazards uh, but essentially didn't go into enough detail of what those hazards are and how they may contribute to a potential rupture. Yes. And are you aware in this docket that um, Summit has not yet commenced, let alone concluded, its Phase two geotechnical surveys? I'm not aware of uh, that information. Uh, that's information that would not be applicable to my scope of work. Were you asked to, or have you re ever reviewed buffer distances, or whether you call them set setbacks or hazard zones, uh, relative to emergency response or public awareness distances? No. And you weren't, meaning Audubon and, and, and your team, were not involved in the initial routing. You were called in after the fact. Is that fair? That's correct. All right. Um, I want to ask you a few specific questions about... Um, the, the tools you utilize, Canary, and, and the Flow, Flow D system. Yes, sir. Um, so you utilized Canary, which, again, is a, a tool, a software, and that's um, sold by a company called Quest Consulting. Is that right? Yes. And then Flow 2D, what, is that also provided by Quest or a different uh, provider? It is not provided by Quest. Do you, do you know who makes that available? Off the top of my head, no, I don't. And you stated that Canary was a, was validated in a series of, of tests, correct? Correct. Uh, and it's true that Canary is, is it called a Gaussian model? Yes. All right. And generally, can you describe what, what that type of a model is? A Gaussian model um, is a model that assumes a 
core, when you're looking at a release, it resumes it assumes a core CO2 um, concentration with dissipation at the edges, if that makes any sense, uh, in, uh, that are nonlinear and follow uh, Gaussian um, equations or Gaussian diminishing returns, if that makes sense. Well, does the, does the Gaussian model have anything to do particularly with the shape of the dispersion? Yes. And, and what exactly, how, how are those related? So, <clears throat> pictures would be better. But, yeah, so the shape of the release plume, so think plume, with a CO2 core, of, with a core of highly concentrated CO2 that mixes and the concentration of the CO2 diminishes towards the edges of the, of the plume. You, in your testimony, talked a little bit about CFD modeling, and again, you understand that to be computational fluid dynamics. Is that right? Yes. Would you agree that that is a more robust tool um, where by more inputs can be utilized to get a more accurate picture of modeling? There's no data that I'm aware of that CFD produces any more accurate, and I want to be careful about that word because you used it, produces any more accurate results than any of the other tools or models that are on the market. Okay, and so because based on your statement that there's no study that states that, what about in your own experience? Have you ever had the occasion to utilize CFD modeling? I have not. I have not seen it used in pipeline vapor dispersion modeling. I've been doing this 30 years. Integrity management has been around for 20 plus years, and I've not seen uh, a pipeline project utilize CFD. And again, with all due respect to you and your experience, you are hired by the pipeline companies, in this case, to do the modeling work, correct? Yes. Okay. So someone from the community, a concerned mom with kids nearby the potential route, they're not your clients. It's industry who wants to get the project cited. That's your client, correct? So... You know, the whole purpose of FIMSA and pipeline safety is, is to protect the public and to protect the environment. I've been doing that, as, you know, in my career for 30 years now. So, yes, Summit Carbon is my client, but I've got an obligation to the public to, um, to protect them as well. Well, but your statement that FIMSA's purposes, safety, and protect the public, that, that only goes so far because they do not have the power to cite, and you would agree the location of the pipeline is what creates the risk. I mean, no, no, absolutely no. not. Okay, so would you agree that a pipeline that doesn't exist is less risky than the one that does? Uh, no, so uh, okay. FEMSA, and I'm not, I'm not answering your question, I'm just I'm continuing off my previous statement. FEMSA is charged with safety of, of liquid and gas pipelines. I don't know if you've looked at the code or read the code, right? But uh, there are all sorts of measures that have been developed since the late 1960s, all sorts of regulations and requirements that have been identified, developed, implemented to protect you and I. Unfortunately, some of those learnings come through tragedy, right? And the fact that, you know, it very rarely, I understand pipelines exist and I understand they're in the ground, but the, the host and wide variety of incident causes and mitigative measures that that directly address those causes, that's what PIMS is all about, right? They're here to protect us. Okay, we, we can agree to disagree on that. My, my question to you was, 
am, am I more or less safe if a hazardous pipeline is located within 100 feet of my home or 100,000 feet of my home? And I'm going to answer it depends. Okay, well, sure, if the one closest never explodes, there's no risk. But understanding that things that humans make tend to leak, spill, rupture somewhere over time, it's pretty obvious that any person who is located in close proximity to hazardous pipelines is inherently more at risk than someone who is much further away. I disagree. Okay. So then if you disagree with that, there's really no point to any of the work that you've done in terms of modeling the distance that a plume could travel because it doesn't matter how close you are to a pipeline. No, sir. You are making a blanket statement, and I could give you good good real-life examples. Uh, Marshall, Michigan was a good example where the crude oil actually found its way into the Kalamazoo River, and I would have been much safer being located uphill 100 feet from that pipeline then I would have been 10 miles downstream of that pipeline. Sure. And, and of course, we're here on um, carbon dioxide. Pipeline. Yes, sir. Okay. So we don't really need to talk about crude oil. So in terms of carbon dioxide, which is the only thing we're, that's relevant here, um, a plume at high concentration, based on your answer about seven answers ago, is most intense at the rupture site, correct? CO2 concentration is greatest there in the atmosphere. Correct. And if I am a person living outside in the atmosphere, the closer I am to that rupture site, the more dangerous it is for me, correct? For CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, yes. All right. Now, um... Do you routinely utilize canary calculations? Yes. Are you able to um, discuss five inputs that you would need in a CFD model that are not needed in canary calculation? Potentially. Is it your testimony that CFD modeling needs or it's required to use more inputs than canary does? Yes. Um, do you believe that CFD cannot do high velocity calculations? Canary has been developed with a jet release in mind. Uh, it has that, it was built around that particular problem. I'm not enough of a student, I'm not familiar enough with CFD to understand how it handles jet releases but I do understand that there are some potential issues with CFD and modeling of a jet release. And when you use the phrase jet release, is that the type of release that would be associated with a guillotine rupture? Correct. Um, Do you believe that CFD modeling cannot include thermodynamic calculations? I have no comment. You don't know either way? I do not know. You wrote that using CFD along the entire length of the pipe would not be feasible. Are you aware of anyone that has suggested CFD should be utilized at every foot along a proposed route? I am not aware. Would you agree that Canary doesn't handle terrain and variations in terrain? I agree. And so Flow 2D, was that Audubon's kind of fix or workaround uh, to the fact that Canary doesn't handle uh, variance in terrain? So Flow 2D was Audubon's tool to address CO2 heavy vapor migration over terrain. Okay. Overland spread model, you know what that is, but just give me the the layperson's definition of what overland spread model means. So dense phase, it doesn't have to be dense phase CO2, uh, any liquid, but uh, CO2 heavy vapor can migrate, you know, downhill 
can migrate by gravity from the release point to some other point away from the pipeline centerline um, based upon the elevation of the terrain in the area. So the overland spread calculation number one is an attempt to identify gravity flow paths between the pipeline center line and HCAs. Number one, and then number two, if those paths do exist to simulate the terrain aided or gravity flow of dense vapor along those paths. Were you aware that Flow 2D solves for um, waves on surfaces or wave equations? Flow 2D is a hydraulic model, yes. You understand that it was initially developed to model mudslides? As I said, it's a hydraulic model. It was, it was developed to handle um, hydraulic flow. Do you think that carbon dioxide travels along the ground like a mudslide or a wave would? Does it obey the laws of gravity? Yes. Well, I'll tell you what, you're doing a great job at asking yourself your own questions, but my question was, do you think that carbon dioxide travels along the ground like a wave or a mudslide would, yes or no? So I answer your question, obviously it travels differently as would water travel along the surface of the ground. In the report, um, you talk about CFD, or maybe not the report, your testimony, you talk about CFD requires an extensive data set that is typically not available at incremental points along a pipeline uh, corridor. Do you stand by that statement? Yeah, and so <clears throat> what I'm really getting at there is um, as the list of, and this doesn't have to apply to CFD, but for any simulation, as the list of input grows, so does the need for making assumptions, right? And so every assumption that you make in a model like that takes you a degree of freedom away from reality, in my experience. So um, when, you, when you're trying to quantify something with such a level of precision, uh, you could be introducing error into the, into the analysis. And again, I'm not speaking direct to CFD, Mr. Jordy. I'm just speaking broadly in experience, simulation and model, and the need for data. For, for the data and input that you utilized to run your modeling that was provided by Summit, did you independently vet or verify that data, or did you simply input it into your software system you utilized? Can you give me an example? Well, I, I don't know what they gave you. Um, I'm assuming they gave you some inputs relative to for instance, valve distance, spacing, shutoff valves, diameter of pipe, volume, those type of fixed things. Yes, sir. All right. Did you independently verify any of those, or did you accept as true the input Summit provided right. you? So our model is based upon the pipeline routing and design drawings as they exist today. So if they told us it was 24-inch, we modeled based on 24-inch. They told us it was... The valve spacing is 10 miles. The simulation is on 10 miles. What I will say is we've spent quite a lot of time um, modeling and remodeling and remodeling based upon changes in the pipeline route, pipeline diameter, pipeline pressure, valve spacing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So as the design gets updated, the model changes. And, okay, and uh, you said you've done two drafts. Does that include the document that was produced for these proceedings, or is that a third iteration of your modeling? No, that includes the documents that have been submitted previously and the documents that are submitted for this hearing. Right. And so how often are you updating based on uh, route changes or modifications? 
I would say for over some period of time, probably twice a month, right? And when I say updating, I'm speaking specifically about changing or updating the inputs into the canary tool. So if a valve spacing changes, the canary inputs change, right? But for instance, those twice a month changes, you're, you're obviously not then creating new drafts because then we'd have 12 drafts or more. Right? That's exactly correct. Uh, are you familiar with um, the term local acceleration and how that's used in modeling? No, sir. Uh, what about diffuse wave? No, sir. Um, what about um, convective term, the convective term? No, sir. Were the calculations you um, perform steady or unsteady? as in terms of, does that phrase mean anything to you, steady or unsteady? Steady and unsteady release rate, steady and unsteady what is what I'm asking? So, yes, release rates. So the release rates were, are not, well, again, remember um, the atmospheric vapor dispersion buffers are based on worst case. Uh, flow rate is one of the inputs, and so the maximum flow rate, which would be at the time of the release, was used to estimate that distance of CO2 concentration at grade. So over time, the release rate will decrease, right? And we have every uh, ability to analyze that. But we, we're looking, remember, at the most conservative case. Do you recollect the release rate pounds per second? I don't. It varies, it varies along the pipeline. Would that number or that input be found anywhere in your analysis that you prepared to your recollection? Yes. Um, if I could have staff please pull up uh, LO 582, landowner 582, please. Thank you. And, sir, you, again, we discussed Quest Consultants, and they've got the Canary program. Are you aware they also offer computational fluid uh, dynamic solutions? Yes, I am. And, and would you agree with that first sentence there that, quote, in some situations the simplifying assumptions made with practical modeling solutions do not apply, end quote? Yes, I think it goes on to say, and I think we've already established the fact that uh, Quest is right up front, and they state that uh, Canary does not handle the effects of terrain as it relates to vapor dispersion modeling for CO2 or other heavy vapors. So they're putting us on notice um, by that statement that, hey, some additional analysis needs to take place here. Would you agree with the statement there that, quote, the techniques of computational fluid dynamics, CFD, are required to find solutions to complex problems where other simpler models are not appropriate, end quote? Yeah, and again, I, I'll restate what I, just, what I just said. So we recognize the limitations of Canary, right? Uh, it's a hammer. It can deal with a nail. When we get to screws... We need another tool. And your solution, rather than doing a, a unified computational fluid dynamic analysis, was to utilize two separate softwares by two separate providers, correct? So, yes, um, 
the overland flow is a result of um, a digital elevation model, which is publicly available in ESRI, and then the flow 2D hydraulic model. I would offer exhibit OO 582. Are there objections? Object on foundation grounds, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Uh, the objection is noted the evidence will be admitted and provided the weight due. I would also offer um, LO550, which is Mr. Luke's deposition. Are there objections? Uh, no objection. It may already be admitted, but no objection in any event. Thank you. Sir, pursuant to your sorry. effort... I'm sorry. We'll admit it again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir, pursuant to your efforts on carbon dioxide modeling, did you uh, utilize or review any, any studies or any best practices relative specifically to carbon dioxide pipeline modeling techniques as opposed to just hazardous pipelines generally? Say that again, I'm sorry. Yep, that's okay. In, in preparation and, and throughout the course of your work and performing the functions that Summit hired you to do, did you or anyone on your team review, study, or utilize any type of uh, peer-reviewed reports or studies specifically on dispersion modeling techniques related to carbon dioxide? So the one report or study uh, that I would offer would be the American Petroleum Institute guidance documents. Uh, I'm aware of that document. We've reviewed that document. Uh, in addition um, to those documents, the Satarsha, um, anything in, well, what I could find related to Satarsha and the shortcut, well, the causes and shortcomings at Satarsha, we reviewed those. Uh, we have experience with uh, other um, CO2 pipeline operators uh, where we have produced vapor dispersion models, uh, we have the benefit of that information. So um, I think I, did, well, I tried to answer a question. Are you familiar, well, certainly you're familiar with uh, the different types of model categories, um, such as integral, um, FD, some of the ones we've been talking about, those generally are? Yes. Okay. Vaguely. Okay. And what about the model names? Are you familiar with SLAB, S-L-A-B? Only through the Australian uh, report. And, and you're there discussing about the, the Sherpa Consulting uh, yes. report? that's All right. right. All right. If, we, if we could pull up, please, LO580. And then if we could go to page 110, please. And if you could just scroll down to the bottom half of the page, just keep going there a little bit, a little bit further, please. There we go. Uh, so this, the slab model, S-L-A-B, uh, do you agree that the Canary software package by, by Quest fits under the the slab model category. That's what it says in this report. All right. And then if we could go to um, page 19, please. Thank you. Now, in terms of your selection and to uh, of the potential tools available to uh, perform the uh, worst case modeling, as you've testified, um, are, are you or have you ever familiarized yourself with a chart like this? And, and if so, did you utilize it to help select the modeling tools you used? So I'm familiar with this chart. And the, uh, and the answer to the second part of your question is no. The date of this report is 2015. It is not state-of-the-art. There have been multiple 
changes, upgrades, etc., um, from Canary and others to improve their product that's offered in the market. And, and that may be true, but would you agree with me that the Canary system uh, also falling under that slab category in the very first um, row there still has not been updated to provide or account for com- complex terrain and obstructions, right? Yes, I've already stated that. And, and the answer would be the same. The Canary model still to this day is not able to account for complex meteorology. I can't answer that question. So between today and 2015, uh, I can't answer whether or not Canary or Quest Consultants has updated their uh, software to handle that particular category. And But you're, are you aware that the, um, the FD or the fluid dynamic modeling uh, choices for software are in fact able to do both of those things account for complex terrain obstructions and account for complex meteorology that's what it says in the report do, do you have any reason to d- dispute that that that's true I do not if we could go to page 108 108 please Do you see there, sir, in in table 8.1, that both FAST and SLAB are listed in the integral model category? And does does integral uh, mean anything specific to you? It does not. Do you understand that both FAST and Canary assume the Gaussian distribution uh, and that they both suffer from the same uh, weaknesses that we've discussed for inability to deal with complex terrain and then complex meteorology? Uh, As far as the effects of complex terrain, I understand meteorology. I couldn't comment. I would offer LO580, please. Is there an objection? Yes, objection on foundation, Your Honor. Okay, uh, the board will admit Jody land out a hearing exhibit 580 and give it the weight there. And um, as a, th- this is contained within that report, but because it's so uh, large, I would also offer LO 581, uh, which is that chart that we discussed uh, previously, a one pager. Objections? The same objection. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Jordy, what was the label on that again? Yes. Jordy Landowner Hearing Exhibit what? 581. 581. Okay. Jordy Landowner Hearing Exhibit 581 will be admitted and given the weight to. Thank you. If I now could have staff please pull up LO506, please. Sir, have, have you ever seen Exhibit 506 before or become aware of its uh, existence? I've seen this. And have you been made aware that in um, the South Dakota Public Utility Commission hearings that Navigator, another proposed CO2 pipeline company, uh, decided to release this particular exhibit and make it public? Uh, not specifically, but I assume since I've seen it, yes, it's public. All right. And given that Summit has varying size in terms of diameter of pipeline, hazardous pipeline proposed for Iowa, did your company do any modeling on 8-inch diameter pipeline? Yes, we did. And do you have any disagreement with the 
hazard distances or the potential release from a eight inch diameter pipeline is shown here to go or to travel as least as far as 1,855 feet from the rupture site. Objection, Your Honor. State your objection. Objection is based on the fact that that's a, a backdoor way of asking what Summit's modeling maps look like, which should be reserved for the confidential session pursuant to the board's order. Well, I just that's sustained. Uh, so we would move your questions to, con to the confidential session. All right, give me a moment there. Well, let, let's uh, forget the actual distances. Let's not go there right now. Can you tell me, without telling me the, the quantity or the actual numbers of the inputs, um, did you model um, varying rates of, of wind speed on a guillotine rupture? Yes. And did you model varying uh, release rates on a guillotine rupture? Yes. Um, and what about release calculation method? Can you just describe what that is? What do you mean? Well, when you input data in the model, in the flow, in the flow 2D model or canary, did it have an ability to have an input of the release calculation, um, meaning the, the time of the release of the volume? So the release duration is what you're asking. Uh, I'll, we'll start with that. Okay, yes. And the release direction you also modeled? Yes, it was modeled as a guillotine break in the most conservative condition. And did you did you say that was five degrees most conservative, or did we not cover that? Five Objection. Degrees. Go ahead. Brian. Objection. It goes with the content of the confidential material. Well, I, I think he actually gave that answer already, but if he didn't, do you recall if we discussed that? I've given the answer previously, yes. Okay, that, and so that because we've already discussed that, I don't need to go further, but it, it, you did say five degrees, correct? Previously. Uh, yes. All right. Um, and is that is that release direction, when you use the word conservative, again, it's, it might be a little confusing, or at least I'll speak for myself. When you're saying conservative, you mean that word to describe actual worst case. That's correct. Okay. And worst case being a defined CO2 concentration maximum distance from center line at grade. What makes you believe that a five degree release is worse or more capable of producing a, a more dangerous event than a vertical release? So when we so when we're looking at those buffers and we're looking at the extents of potentially impacted receptors, the optimized angle produces the largest distance there for the concentration, whatever that might be. Whatever you whatever wherever we decide to draw a line or lines on the concentration that grade. And, and is that true, using that five degree input, is that true even if we change the other variables? Are, are you able to testify that all things being equal, the five degree release will across the board generate the worst case? In terms of the limits of those buffers? Yes. And atmospheric temperature, uh, I think we've talked about that, you, you modeled that variable, right? Yes. And does temperature of the CO2 molecules themselves inside the pipe, is that something that you modeled? And if, if not, why not? Yes. Okay. 
And did you model that across uh, varying temperatures, understanding that the temperature can uh, fluctuate throughout the length of the pipeline? I understand the latter, yes. Atmospheric stability class, you're familiar that that is um, on a gradient of class A to class F, correct? Yes. With F being describing the most unstable weather conditions. I don't think that's right. I think F is, if I had the chart in front of me, I could, I could state, I, I just don't want to make sure you've got it backwards. I, okay, I think you're right. I think A is the most unstable that's or volatile, volatile, then F would be the most calm, I can most say. Most stable. Yeah. Most stable. And so, relative to our discussion on wind speed, would you agree that we would want to model an F-class stability to get to a worst case, most likely? Yes. All right. And, and again, I, not a trick question, but just because there's less turbulence, there's less yeah. wind, there's less dispersion, right, generally? Yes, I'm just, you know, and, and I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to give you a trick answer. I just want to make sure that I'm, you know, should be disclosing results. Well, and, and I appreciate that. I'm not getting to results. I just am trying to understand the, the inputs without even asking you um, too much detail, but I appreciate that. And then your modeling was focused on, um, uh, a, a 40,000 parts per million um, concentration, correct? Objection. That does go to the content of the confidential documents. Okay. Do you, do you believe that uh, Navigator in its exhibit that we were looking at earlier, 506, was uh, prudent in selecting 40,000 parts per million in its worst case analysis? So I think there are any number of ways to display the results graphically of the modeling. As I said previously, you have to draw some lines somewhere. Um, the lines all mean different things for different folks, but um, the 4% CO2 concentration is one of the boundaries that I think you know most pipeline operators would consider uh, drawing, if that makes any sense. And, and would you agree that that's because at, at lower levels, perhaps we're not as concerned, um, and that that 4%, 4 which equates to 40,000 parts per million, is a, a level where we're, we're concerned about hazard and risk, and that's why we, we model that? So <clears throat> I, will, uh, I will say that uh, that particular value was one that Summit was interested in in drawing or displaying, um, I, I will say it's it's not arbitrary, but for me, you know, that, that wasn't, like I said, if you want to see a concentration plume versus distance, or that's fine, we could do that, but it may, may not be easy to understand or interpret, so. And in terms of, um, you know, a layperson might think, well, a 24-inch pipeline say, in a 10-mile span, if we just shut off the valves and we just accepted that it was at full capacity at 10 miles by 8 inches, that that would be one-third the volume of a 24-inch pipeline over the same span. But is it, in fact, true, sir, that the volume in a given pipeline length is not a linear progression? Is that true? That is true. And in fact, in a 24 inch pipeline, which is obviously three times eight, there is more than three times the amount of, of volume and CO2 capacity. The volume of any cylinder is proportional to the radius squared. Okay, times the length. See, that's why we've got you here. And so, what then would be the, the factor? The, the multiplier, if I wanted to understand the difference in volume between a 24-inch segment and an 8-inch segment with the length being the same? 
terms of modeling, that would be your release rate. Okay. But can you just tell me, like, for instance, is it, you say, Mr. Jordy, oh, if, if, yeah, if you had a 10-mile, 24-inch, you could actually have five times the volume that would be in an 8-inch? I'm just curious how we calculate that. I'd be speculating if I said anything. Um, I'm thinking about examples and... It's not linear, so. Well, you just told me about but the radius squared. It's it's not linear, but it's not um, factors of some power. It's somewhere in between. Okay, and I I'm I'm a lawyer because I'm not a math guy, so I need I need your help. I mean, is there? I mean, certainly there's a calculation that should be pretty straightforward. Do you know what that is? Objection. Say to objection. Calls for speculation. <laughs> We're asking the witness to do some fairly complex math in his head on the stand. So if you know the answer, you may answer it, but you don't have to. The answer is, is that's what the modeling tools are working out. Okay. That's, so instead of using rules of thumb, like we're trying to do here, Canary is actually telling us, based on the thermodynamics and the hydraulics, where those concentrations are going to be. And, and I'll take your word for that, but I have a calculator here. I, I want to know a rule of thumb without getting precise and is it just the, the radius squared or I mean there obviously we're calculating volumes this isn't yeah. but the, but you're trying to make you're trying to infer something about concentration at grade based on volume alone and that doesn't make any sense well I that can be said about me a lot of times but I, I'm as, as, asking the questions and so it forget dispersion forget a leak Forget there's a rupture. I just want to know how do we figure out the volume in a cylinder between 8 inch to 24 inch if we know it's greater than three times? How do we figure that out? I just, we just talked about how to calculate volume of a cylinder. It's a straightforward mathematical equation that's not directly related to vapor dispersion model. I understand that. I'm just at the first part. So radius is, is half the diameter, right? So we take 4 squared. Does that get us there or just help me out and then I'm going to move on? This would be pure speculation on my point. There's no there's no reason. I mean, like I said, uh, the, the software is working that out. That's the whole purpose of the software based upon all of the inputs that we've talked about is to tell us where the CO2 vapor uh, concentration is on the ground. Right, and I'm sorry if you're getting confused, but I'm not talking about concentration on the ground. It, this, this hasn't even left the pipeline. Uh, my question is within the pipeline, just yes. within a cylinder. Yep. That's all, that's all I want to do. Okay. Okay. So remember, 8-inch cylinder, pick the distance, doesn't matter to me, and then a 24-inch Cylinder, same distance as eight inch. How do we, how do we figure out that multiplier? The multiplier for what? The, the ratio of volumes. Vol yes, sir. Okay. We you, we've we've talked about it. It's so the equation for volume of a cylinder is pi r squared l. So okay. get your calculator out. Do it for the different diameters. Okay, and so once we do that, and then we just can figure out, obviously divide the two, and then we get the, the ratio, right? The volume, yes, in the pipeline. All right, very good. See, that wasn't so hard. It was not. Um, okay, let's see. I'm trying to see if I have anything else, Your Honor, before I am getting too close to the confidential um, items here. Give me one moment. Did you, pref 
I think you mentioned that you performed um, analysis, uh, dispersion analysis per state on the footprint. Was that true, or was it just a handful of the states? We've done the analysis for every mile of this pipeline, to my knowledge. Okay, across the footprint. Correct. All right. And um, would you have then utilized specific geographic areas in each state uh, that's specific to a worst case event per state? Per state. Per state. Okay. Yes. All right. I think I'll, I'll pass and reserve the balance for a confidential session. Okay. Mr. Meyer. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Meyer. I don't have nearly as many questions, and I hope I can ask them in a way that we can stay here and stay on the record here as we are. Um, looking at your rebuttal testimony on page 7, you were addressing um, some of the, I guess, Mr. Creighton's uh, testimony, and I wanted to ask about some of the, uh, the, the pressure that you mentioned in your answer on page 7. Okay. Um, you say the maximum operating pressure is, you say, uh, in Hardin County is 2,183 PSI G. I know what PSI, that's pounds per square inch. What's the G for Gauge. gas? What's that? Gauge. Gauge, okay. It subtracts atmospheric pressure from the pressure in the water. Do you know if that maximum pressure or that figure, that 2,183, is the maximum structural integrity of the proposed pipeline? It is not. I would assume it's less? It is less. Is the, just generally speaking, because I don't know if they will consider you know, the structural integrity, uh, confidential information, but does that structural integrity increase or decrease when you go from a 6 to an 8 to a 24-inch pipe? Or is it the same? So when you look at allowable stress in any cylinder, the outside diameter is part of the equation. And it's in the denominator. So, as the diameter increases, the maximum pressure that that cylinder will supply decreases, or cylinder will hold decreases. For a given, all else being the same in that equation, right? So, for a given wall thickness, for a given grade, et cetera, et cetera. So the structural integrity of a six-inch pipe is going to be less than a, the structural integrity of a twenty-four yeah. inch pipe. No, that's that's not the case. So when you're when you're calculating the maximum, the design pressure, or the maximum pressure, or the burst pressure, which all tend to kind of line up, uh, it's a, it's a function of the allowable stress of the material. It's a function of the wall thickness and it's a function of the OD. So I can manipulate. So if I know I've got a larger pipe and I want to be able to operate at a certain pressure, I can use materials that exhibit higher allowable stresses. I can increase wall thickness to get to that pressure. Does that make sense? So far. So. so for your model, did you use what Summit is claiming for an operating pressure or yes. the structural integrity pressure? 
the MOP. So the MOP, it's not um, an arbitrary number. It, think of it as the speed limit in terms of pressure. So every pipeline in this country, whether it's gas or liquid, has an MAOP or MOP. Pipeline op operators are obligated not to exceed that pressure. They can never uh, operate above that MOP. Well, my car will go higher than 55, right. even though I'm not supposed to. Right. So what we're asking about is what happens when I go over 55 by human error or structural error or some failure. So I'm wondering, would you be able to run the model using the structural maximum tolerance because when it blows it isn't going to be 55 that causes the problem it's going to be when i'm going 90. yeah so there are measures and i'm, I'm going to try and answer your question so th anything's possible all right but there are measures and provisions on this pipeline and any pipeline that protect that mop overpressure protection, right? So you might be able to go higher than 55, but the UPS truck next to you has a governor on it that limits it to 55, no matter how hard you press the accelerator. I, I get it. Right. We're, we're trying to avoid speeding, right. but if the folks in Hardin County want to be prepared for the worst possible scenario, shouldn't we expect the pipe to mm -hmm. blow at its structural failure? No. Why not? Uh, so, I mean, so remember um, the MOP, it, it includes some safety factor, which is based upon so some design factor, right? And that MOP is um, based also based upon, I put a half inch thick wall in the pipe and a, a thick wall, wall thickness pipe in the ground, and I got a half-inch wall thickness pipe in the ground, right? Uh, that's not always the case. So the whole purpose of the MOP is to provide some margin of safety from between the operating pressure and the burst pressure between which the operator is obligated to protect that number. That's why we can't exceed it, right? And also assess at the same time to make sure that on day 365 that that pipeline is in the same condition as it was on day one, right? So MOP is something, um, it's your speed limit. There's a safety factor between there and burst pressure. We never want to get to burst pressure regardless. So um, if we're doing a laboratory experiment, then I think the answer to your question is yes, but this is actually taking steel out, putting it in the ground, and operating. Okay, Does that make it, sense? I understand you okay. want to pick and choose the numbers you input, but let's let's input the worst case scenario because you haven't even done that yet, have you? The but we have not used the burst pressure. I mean, theoretically, again, you could, right? You would never exceed the MOP. That's why it's there. But you could run that model. Sure, we can input any pressure. Why don't you use the rupture pressure? I know you I, take out the word why. Would yeah. you please run the rupture pressure for Hardin County? So, so we can prepare I've, for that. I've stated several times that we've used the um, most, you know, this is a conservative approach. The most conservative pressure number to input into this model is the MOP. Not all parts or segments of our feet of this pipeline will see 2183, right? Do you think, would it be your, drawing by analogy here, should the, the transportation department create safety seat belts that will succeed up to 55 miles per hour, but beyond that, they're just going to fall apart? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to not well, that's what you're asking. follow that. That's what you're Mr. Expecting. Meyer, uh, can we just just make sure we're not speaking over each other? I think so. Um, Sorry, we got to make sure that the, the record is clean. So just make sure we're finishing our sentences. Thank okay. You. Yeah. So 
the worst case pressure that this pipeline will ever see uh, under the 195 rules laws is 2183. And that's the number that we're using for the vapor dispersion model. You can't guarantee that it's going to operate within the law, can you? Uh, it's an engineered piece of equipment, right? That's designed to to operate at that pressure. And there's a saying: if you it, with, for equipment, if you use it, it will break. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure where you're going with this, but you know, the the, the safety factor that that's built into this, or the design margin, is there to protect against some of the things that you're talking about. On paper, it works perfectly. I, I got no, I've got no comment to that. This is in your thirty years' experience with pipeline integrity. Um, would you agree that um, fail points are at joints or uh, elbows in the line? No, I would not agree. So the number of, so asking Summit to turn more here or there isn't going to create more uh, safety concerns, in your opinion? That's correct. I have no other questions. Thank you, Mr. Whipple. Uh, just one question for the open session for you, Mr. Luke. Um, do you happen to know what the actual pressure was in the Satarsha incident when it ruptured? I do not. Um, it, I do know that it was a dense phase uh, CO2 pipeline, and it was probably class 900, which would have given them the option to operate at pressures similar to um, this pipeline. But as, in terms of what they were operating at, I have no idea. Um, but just to refer to the questioning a moment ago from Mr. Meyer, can you be certain that they were operating within the maximum operating pressure? Yes. When the, you can be certain. Of it. Yes. If if they were they had exceeded the MOP, that would have been in the accident report. They would have paid fines. It would have been really, really not good for them. Okay. That's all I have for uh, the non closed session. You're on. Thank you, uh, Ms. Grunhagen. I believe Mr. Taylor's tent was up first. Oh, he was on my list first. Sorry, Mr. Taylor. <laughs> um, you've mentioned guillotine uh, ruptures or guillotine cuts. If if a if the pipe wears out or uh, it's corroded or there's some pressure put on it that's more than it can handle. Would it always be a guillotine rupture, or is there some other the type of uh, uh, rupture it might be? There are other failure modes, to your point, sir. So, so why do you just talk about a guillotine rupture? Because we're talking about conservative. Um, we're talking about a conservative approach here. We're talking about impacting the largest number of receptors. Okay. So a guillotine rupture would give you the worst case scenario. Yes, sir. Okay. Got it. Okay. Um, I have seen videos of a uh, CO2 rupture, and it looks like there's a big white plume that comes out first, then it goes down to the ground, and then as it gets farther out, um, it becomes less colorful, shall we say. Uh, is, that, is that how you envision it? No, sir. I think some of those videos that are out there that you're referring to are actually water or water vapor. So I, I hesitate to speculate, but what, so I'll leave it at that. Okay. Well, the one I saw was from DNV, which is yep. a reputable firm. I think I would reserve that question for John Godfrey. Okay. Uh, and let John answer that question. All right. So, what do you envision a CO2 
plume and dispersion would look like. So what it would look like, it would, it would be really loud, right? Um, uh, jet release, it would be really loud, it would be really disruptive. Um, you've, got the, uh, you've got the cooling effect going on there, so any water vapor that was in the air in the vicinity, so water vapor it would be what you see coming out of the stacks of power plants, right? You would start to see water uh, vapor form in and around the area and then you would there would be some uh, presence or visual presence of uh, a dense phase or a dense vapor sorry co2 component um, you would probably also well there would also be some solid particle fallout Right? Um, from the cooling effect on the CO2 itself. Beyond that, I'm guessing. Okay. Uh, one final topic here. Um, depending on where the rupture is on the pipe, would the angle of the uh, release be different? In other words, it might come straight up or it might come out at an angle? Does that affect the uh, dispersion modeling? Yes, sir. The, the angle of the leak does impact the CO2 dispersion. Okay. And then that's something you take into consideration in your, your modeling? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kroon-Hagen. Thank you, Your Honor. I just have two quick questions sure um first and i assume the answer is yes to this but will will summit's plan and uh, integrity manager plan include high consequence areas yes all pipeline operators plans will include high consequence area identification um will their integrity manager plan include any uh, non high consequence areas on the route Um, and I'm, I'm going to split hairs here. Um, when you look at the 195 code, high consequence areas and integrity management are synonymous. You can't separate them. Okay. There are other, and I hate to even say this, there are other integrity, ass other assessments or other integrity type assessments that do have to be performed outside of high consequence areas. Those assessments are brand new as a result of the mega rule. So within the last year, that became part of the law. So as far as the integrity and, man. And the ahead. last thing I'll say, and this is where I'm splitting hairs, all of that is covered. So non-ACA is covered under operations and maintenance. ACA is is under the integrity management section. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. Ms. Ryan, I'm sorry I didn't see your name tag hiding behind Mr. Whipple, so go ahead. That's all right. I just have a couple of quick uh, questions to follow up on something that Mr. Taylor asked you about. He had asked about uh, other uh, types of, of uh, ruptures, and I was interested in finding out specifically if you had run any drafts using a running ductile fracture. So um, that was not part of our scope of work. We, the worst case that we've identified would be the guillotine break. So it would be your contention that a guillotine break would create a worst case scenario, it would be worse than a running ductile fracture? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Any other questions from the Hardys before we go into confidential session? Yes. I, I have a couple I forgot. I'm sorry. It'll be quick. Um, go ahead. Okay. Um, sir, do you agree that if 
uh, it's reasonable for a landowner who's being asked to sign an easement that would host this hazardous pipeline that they have in hand uh, in order to make an informed des decision, your worst case analysis that you prepared for your client. I'm not going to speculate there. You don't have an opinion either way? No, I don't. Um, <clears throat> we touched a little bit on risk avoidance. Are, are you generally familiar with these concepts, risk avoidance, risk management, event response? So the first two, absolutely, event response could mean multiple things to me. And would you agree that risk in, in looking at risk avoidance, uh, one could utilize air dispersion and plume programs to minimize the collective impact and utilize that in, in routing as to avoid many of the at-risk areas? In my, what I consider risk avoidance uh, would not encapsulate what you're talking about. So, so risk avoidance are, are the physical barriers that we can put in place to prevent an, an event from even happening. So to be clear, you don't believe that selecting a location of a hazardous pipeline is a variable in risk avoidance. And I mean, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to answer your question, you know, so risk avoidance would be if if I want to put barriers in place to make sure this never happens, like increasing wall thickness, that's a risk avoidance strategy. Okay. I, I totally get that. I just want to pin you down here in the way you look at the concept of avoiding risk or risk avoidance does not include where to or where not to locate a pipeline. You're talking about after the fact variables. No, uh, it's not. It, it wouldn't include where to locate a pipeline. Risk avoidance are those things that we can do to make sure or to lower the possibility of anything ever, any event ever happening. Does that make sense? And, and but those factors such as wall thickness or valve spacing, those are all after. A pipeline obviously is located and exists. There are several there are several risk avoidance strategies that are available, and there are several risk management strategies that are also available. I think uh, the risk of in my you want my opinion, risk avoidance has everything to do with the pipeline itself and the design phase. Um, risk. You may be getting into risk management with some of the things that you're talking about. Well, what I'm talking about is the the existence and the the decision on where or where not to locate a hazardous pipeline. From your perspective, you don't put that in the risk avoidance category. That's a good question for Ken Mobar. Okay, but but since you're here. But is it true that you don't put that from your personal perspective in the risk avoidance category, right? I agree with you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. That's all. Okay. So a couple, sorry, a couple quick things uh, before we break. Um, we're going to start at 8.30 tomorrow um, for planning purposes. I need to get an idea from the parties of how long we'll be in confidential session. And obviously we don't need to be rigid about it, but I just need to get an idea of how long we need for confidential. Uh, Your Honor, I, th I think I have a, at least one hour, which probably means more, but that's as best as I can give you right now. Your Honor, I would anticipate 10, maybe 15 minutes. Okay, so about par for where we've been on most questions.
I guess um, for Summit, would it make more sense to send Mr. Luke home and uh, relieve him for the day and move on to the next witness and then come back into confidential session tomorrow? Mr. Um, Leonard and I haven't had a chance to, to talk about or think about that. But do, do you want 15 minutes to think about that? We can be back here in 15 minutes. We're going to take a 15-minute break right now anyway. <laughs> okay. So yeah, let's, let's just take it. Let's come back in 15 minutes. Um, we'll be here shortly before 5 o'clock. <laughs>